Hi, welcome to the CIPD London OD sessions that we're running. Um, so we're running a session in autumn and it's all about change. And this is basically for OD practitioners who are looking to sort of expand their learning. And so we've invited the brilliant Steve Hearson to our session this month. And what we wanted to do is as preparation for it is to just, because Steve's got a lot of brilliant ideas that he's gained through his 20 years experience, working in a whole variety of different contexts um, as an experienced consultant and also sort of um, training the next generation of OD practitioners as well, um, to sort of really sort of gain his insights that will kind of sort of be like an addendum to the session itself as well. So if you can't make it, uh, there'll be loads of insights. Um, it's been really nice doing preparation for the session. So I've actually listened to a a lot of Steve's uh, sessions. Um, I first heard about uh, Steve um, from my uh, business partner, Danny, who was on his 10 day OD program. And um, his kind of slogan is, what is it, Steve? The right fly, the right ointment. Fl- the right, the right fl- kind of fly in the ointment. Yeah, this was, I was described as that by a former colleague. Brilliant. It's not my, it's not my language. And, and Danny's experience very much was that some really sort of searching, thought provoking questions throughout the 10 days. So uh, for those of you that can join the session, it's on the 18th of October um, and it's at 12 o'clock. Um, you'll get a lot of value from it as well. So in this session, what we really wanted to do is just obviously give Stephen an opportunity to introduce himself. Um, and we're going to be covering sort of two areas here, which is for those people that are looking to sort of enter OD, whether you're a business partner or an internal consultant, um, or if you're just, you know, you want to go into OD consultant itself, what is that kind of journey? What are some of the learnings along the way? Um, and then the second part, the thing that Steve's really thinking about a lot at the moment is when you're in- inevitably in the centre of change, what do we do? So as um, as we start to sort of disrupt the system and make changes, or we're actually part of a program that's doing that, what can we do to make sure that we're looking, doing the right things for ourselves, our teams, our systems, and the project as well? So, uh, so Steve, um, I probably can't do you justice in terms of your introduction. Um, can you just just take us through a little bit about your sort of journey to where you are now, just briefly? Um, well, I don't want to bore anybody watching rigid um, as it can be incredibly tedious hearing somebody chunter on about their life story so I guess I'm wondering what would be useful so in a nutshell um, I I guess the start of where where I ended up now was working at the Guardian in the late 90s and at that point um, they were doing a large process review of the organization um, across both papers Guardian Observer and they had some external consultants in and these were the first consultants never to be spat out by the organization, spat out by journalists. I'm married to a journalist, I'm allowed to say this. You know, journalists are a hard crowd. Okay? Mm. Um, and these, they spat out Andersons and all the other big consultancies. Whereas this small consultancy were slightly older, more gnarled, and were not phased by a journalist going at them about how they didn't understand editorial. Um, And I was the only person to volunteer to go on part of an internal team to work with these consultants, because at that point I'd got to the stage of kind of going, but if you just talk to you and that bit was connected to that, wouldn't life be a lot easier? So I'd started to kind of get interested in the stuff that went on between the cracks and the the gaps. Fast forward, left in 2002, was a jobbing consultant for 10 years. Didn't really, to be honest, know what my identity was and washed up um, at Roffey Park in 2013. And I suppose the connection to OD um, was three months in, a colleague of mine said to me, you're one of them now. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you're part of the OD faculty, the OD group. And I said, but I've never called myself OD, didn't have it on my application, on my CV. To which she responded, ah, it doesn't matter. And it was at that point I joined the Freemasons of of OD. (laughs) What, What OD, I think, at its worst is a bit like, for those of you who've read Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, they're like one of the guilds um, and you kind of get anointed or you have that little barcode tattooed on your neck without you even realising it and suddenly you're part of this thought collective. So from that point onwards, I was part of, of, of OD. Um, I joined the board of od and became its co- co-chair at COD Network Europe. Um, and I still move in and out of that community. We had the conference last week and I was there again, kind of poking in the shadows a bit, which is what I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, so my, 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 my work in OD, I suppose, is, is or, or I, I joined OD when I was told I was OD. But if I'm really honest, Aaron, I'm, I, I tend to be happiest. I tend to n- not join fully because I think if you join fully, then you lose sight of what you see on the periphery. 
Mm, it's interesting because I guess like if, even like me as an external consultant, like my clients do not call me OD. They they have no interest in they, they wouldn't even know what OD is. But I guess that sort of leads the question. So um, OD is a very broad profession. It's there's hard OD, there's soft OD, there's diagnostic OD, there's dialogic OD. Well, let's not go into all that now. Um, there's a lot of definitions and there's a lot of different sort of sort of uh, approaches to it. But what, what does OD mean to you? My you know my immediate thought is, and this this happens in you know the OD community a lot is we try and define it and redefine it. Um, I have two responses. One is slightly flippant, which is who cares. Mm-hmm. Um, because actually clients often don't care, it's to your point. I ran a, an event a few years ago with um, the lovely Nick Richmond from the European All, All Design Forum, and, 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 and we did that with ODNE. And we asked the question, you know, labels, do clients care? And the short answer from the, from the group of clients we had was, well, no, we don't. And one person actually said, all I care about is, does a consultant understand changing human systems? Secondly, can they intervene in human systems? And I prodded her and said, so that's all you care about? And she said, yeah, that's all I care about. Which leads me to my second point, which is actually fundamentally OD is a change practice. You know, strip away the rhetoric. It's a change practice. If you're not involved in change, then what on earth are you doing? And that takes me to the second point, which is um, how does then OD differ from other fields of practice? So all design, change management, project management, HR. And I would argue that the fundamental and significant difference is the values. This is the OD grew out of post-World War II, the pain of, of um, the destruction of multiple uh, countries, and a group of people who wanted to come up with ways of connecting and reconnecting and healing, both interculturally and in organisations. And that's where you get the slight kind of tension now, because um, how many of, us, many of us who actually do OD actually really live OD values, really live them? I'd argue we don't. If you mm-hmm. wanted to be really provocative, right? Um, if you read or listen to Mark Cole, who's written a really interesting book on OD a couple of years ago, he argues that um, OD values are utterly incompatible with a capitalist system. Now, whether you agree with that totally or not, actually, it's from a, from a, as a thought experiment, it's it's a really interesting challenge because you could construct an argument that no, no, OD is not. If you look at its values, it's not. Um, congruent with with, uh, with capitalist values. Yeah, it's a, it's a real tension to manage, isn't it? Um, you know, when you are sort of helping, a change initiative often is in the service of growing something or increasing something, but obviously it is fooled by the efforts of humans, isn't it? So uh, yeah. that's that's yeah. often the challenge there, isn't it? How can you do it in a, I guess the OD is often about make, doing it in a sustainable way. Um, Define sustainable. I mean, sustainable in, in, in the eyes of shareholders who want to return or define decide, uh, sustainable in terms of um, stakeholders who are employees or is it the people who live in the communities where the organisation is based or do we then look at the supply chain? Mm. Because they're not the same. Yeah. And, and I think that I guess what, what we're sort of taking from, from what I'm taking from this is that because um, often you know, OD is often accused of being a little bit elitist. You know, you have to study for an enormous amount of years to, to you know, to do the qualifications or, you know, it often feels just a little bit out of, out of reach for people, but you're sort of describing oh. it as <laughs> as a change, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, a profession that sort of changes systems and that as well. So potentially people can build OD into their, their roles as part of their day-to-day life. Well, here we get to kind of, I suppose, a gnarly question about what's enough experience Mm -hmm. to do OD. So one of the things I noticed as I started to find my way into the OD community was what I would describe as a really patronising attitude to anybody under the age of 30, 35. I could be under the age of 40. If you're under the age of 30 and you wander into the OD community, and I know this because I've spoken to people who have wandered into um, ODNE and our conferences, and you talk to them about their experience and they feel patronised. One uh, lovely uh, German guy I know, um, he said to me, uh, he was told when he, when he interviewed for a job when he was about 23, 24, uh, you need to go and get more experience in OD before you can apply for an OD job. So if you just think about that for a moment and you, if you've read Catch-22, you'll understand the total contradiction in that. Um, and there's, a, there's another problem here, which is the assumption that if you're in your 20s, you either A, have not had enough experience to be sufficiently skilled to start working in it, and B, 
more dangerously that you have nothing to teach in return is deeply problematic. Now, I don't know mm. about you, but my experience of working with people in their 20s, um, we know naff all about some of the stuff they're expert in. So we talk about digital and stuff like that. And one of the most salutary and um, humbling moments was my, when my wife, who's a lecturer, said to me a few years ago as I was banging on about digital and change and OD, she said to me very quietly, Steve, you do realise that the word digital is, is what the old folks use? <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, none of my students use the word digital. For them, it's just life. And if you talk to people in their early 20s or their late teens, they don't use the word digital. Mm. I've tested this out. And every person of that age I've asked, they've all gone, yeah, just life. Well, you, so, you, you've just killed an entire industry of digital transformation specialists. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, it's and, and if we just pick up this thing about so then therefore, what, what's the experience we need? There's somebody I know who I'm working with again shortly on, on uh, the program that I'm running, who I first met on a similar program to the one that um, Danny did with me. And this one, when I met her, was, I think, in her early 20s. And bear in mind, she was in a room with people who are in their 30s, 40s and 50s. She was the one who was consistently asking really great questions. She has a natural aptitude for asking questions and with, with a bit of forcefulness behind them. It was a kind of raw um, skill there. So why on earth would we ask her to wait till she's 35 before she gets anywhere near a client? Yeah. And, and just sort of help, because it is often it is about asking the right question. It's like, so so this is how it is. And I'm like, so what, yeah. what, are the, what were the nature of the questions that she was asking that were making them so there were impactful? questions that sought to go beneath the obvious or to go beneath the presenting um, situation. Um, they're questions which were born of actually a desire to inquire into or to challenge something that she was kind of going, but I don't understand. Mm -hmm. If you think about the nature of OD and you think about the nature of change practice that seeks to influence what's going on in organisations, fundamentally, it's an inquiry based approach. We, we ask questions to help clients inquire into their current reality, their here and now, and to consider what the options might be. And if we didn't do that, why are we there? Mm. What on earth are we doing? Um, so she had a natural aptitude for that. So if we link it then to your question about what's, how do you get into it? I, I guess I, I think there is a tension, which is if you have some life experience, it kind of helps. Um, but we need to be really careful about these hard and fast rules around you're, you're only 23, you're only 25, therefore come back in 10 years time. That's really patronizing and problematic. Yeah, and I, and I guess, um, it's, and often, you know, part of the sort of transition into becoming like the, the OD practitioner is, is like a, it's a mindset shift and an orientation to the world, isn't it, in terms of how you sort of experience things? Yeah, but okay, let's let's just pull a thread hanging from that one, right? Mm -hmm. So, mind if if I need to do a mindset mindset shift, and tell me if you agree with this, that requires some form of reflective practice. Okay. Yeah. So, I have a hypothesis that actually OD practitioners, practitioners as, a, as a community that we're not as up for deep reflective practice as we like to say we are, or like to think we are. And why do I say that? Um, I've got one really solid data point. So in my kind of work as I think, as I build my own supervisory practice, what's emerged is I've only found three places you can go and get a qualification in doing consulting supervision. And you can go nowhere to get certified as a supervisor of consultants. You can get super supervised, get certified as a, as a coaching supervisor, but not as a supervisor of consultants. So that raises some interesting questions about A, the ethics of the entire consulting industry, mm -hmm. whether you're OD or change or anything else, and B, what on earth are we all doing in terms of keeping ourselves clean? Where do we go to do our reflective practice to make sense of our own shadows so that when we work with our client shadows, their, their own mess, that we're able to disentangle ours from theirs? Where are we doing that work? Yeah, and it is important, isn't it? Because I guess, you know, the, the sort of the term you hear most about sort of the OD practitioner when you think about them, themselves as self as instrument, isn't it? And therefore, you need to have a deep understanding of self and the ability to have that space. So like, like sort of saying, I've, I've had a lot of supervision over the years and it's just it's a, just a really good place to go, Ooh. whatever you're doing, just to make sense of what's going on what's my stuff and what's the system stuff as well um, and you actually run a, a supervision course a program yeah. yourself that's that's yeah. launching in november is that right yeah yeah um and I, I guess picking up your point there though 
and I, if I speak from I, you know, there's points in my early, early in my career where, and in fact, I think of one moment where I had a choice when I was when I did my masters, and I'd just done a practice facilitation. I'd called myself a facilitator up to that point, and I've just done a practice facilitation with my peers, and it's tanked. Right, it is the worst thing that, I, that could have happened. I felt exposed, ashamed, disappointed. You know, you name it. And I had two choices. One was to run screaming from the room and never facilitate again. Or two was to get curious as to why on earth I was facilitating, calling myself a facilitator. And actually, if I was honest with myself, I found it utterly distressing. Mm. So I chose to go and do some more work and hello, another four and a half years of therapy, bluntly. Um, but I guess my point is, you know, how often when we are really challenged in a client situation, but I'm talking about profoundly, mm. something has really kind of caught something that is unresolved is archaic do we go okay then right shall i go and have a look at what that is just in case it comes up again yeah it, <laughs> it, it, it can be genuinely quite disturbing can't it when you yeah. when you're working with a client yeah. and you know you're disrupting a system or um and, and i sort of did the masters as well and there's quite a few times i just felt What's the, my, I think my tutor described it as you look very discombobulated because yeah. <laughs> it's literally like the fabric of who you are starts to untangle a bit like how you see the world how you make sense yeah. of things as well so it is it is very profound isn't it and I, I guess that's the challenge of if, if you have OD which is something that people aspire to that a lot of people might be sort of maybe calling themselves OD but that maybe they haven't done the work it's better to actually not have the label and just do the work anyway well, well here's, here's the interesting thing. So, obviously, we, we lost the, 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 the lovely Mian Chung Judge earlier this mm. year, very recently, right? Um, and at the ODNE conference, there was a lovely half hour session where we had a huge circle where people who were just invited to share their reflections on, on her. And what I really liked was the fact that there was some real honouring of the fact that she wasn't perfect, that she embraced her own messiness. And it would be really interesting to see whether that gets edited out of the story. Mm. Here was somebody who was, you know, figural and really important in terms of the evolution of, of OD practice, particularly in Europe, who also was really clear about her edges. Mm. Okay. So how comfortable are we kind of going, yeah, that's where I'm, I struggle. So there's, there's, to give you another take on it, um, you know, I don't know what this is true for everyone, but I suspect for, for a lot of us, and, and, and I'd, I'd be interested in your response. There's th there's that thing you kind of know you're going to be working on for the rest of your life. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's that thing that probably comes from some point quite early on in your life, which set yeah. the conditions for who you are and your patterns of behaviour. And you know, I know what my thing is, mm -hmm. and you know, my thing will always be how do I ma maintain contact and make contact, and, and mm -hmm. how do I ensure I don't lose contact with, with mm -hmm. you. But two years ago, you know, I did an, I did a Gestalt program and I, you know, I thought I'd, I'd understood this and nailed it. And I had a lovely moment where I, I, I realized was it just got a lot sneakier. Mm, yeah. And I, I now know that this is, this is going to be my life's work. It's always going to be there. It's also part of what makes me when I'm at my best good at what I do, but it's still going to be my life's work. It's still going to be the thing that, that sometimes is going to absolutely mean I fall flat on my face. Yeah, and it, it's difficult as well because when you when you do go into an organisation, obviously you know we, you are often projected onto as like the saviour or the things, and it's very easy to take that invitation. But it is really important to make sure that you are fallible, you don't have all the answers. You know that that five step process that everyone would like to hear, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, come on, I mean, if you're anything like me, there are those moments where part of you kind of goes, "Oh, stroke me again." <laughs> Come on, it's absolutely lovely at one level to have a client project onto you. Oh, you're, you're an expert in, in OD, Steve. Now, I always disabuse clients of that and say, no, I'm not. I know some stuff. I've got some mm. questions. But please don't project onto me. I'm your saviour. No, I'm not having that. That's, that's an abdication of responsibility. But equally, there are moments where more subtly I get stroked. And if I'm really honest, I really like it. Mm. Of course I do. Because why wouldn't I want to be appreciated? But the, the tension is, am I able to sift from sift in those conversations recognize when it's an unhelpful projection when i need to challenge it and when actually sometimes there's a bit of appreciation that's probably worthwhile you accepting 
Yeah. And it also helps you understand your clients or your stakeholders a lot better as well, because then you can understand where they're coming from and what might be driving their behavior as well. Um, I guess, um, you know, we're doing one of the programs we're running is like how to get into OD. Um, I I could think I'm sort of really curious about. So you do this sort of 10 day program, um, obviously, and there's a lot of other things that you do as well. But what do you often see in that 10 days, like the shift that you see in people like this? I would say this is this is the thing that I consistently notice is that the people who kind of who arrive kind of going thinking this space is for them and have this moment of going oh god yeah this is what I want this is um, this is what I, I I was in HR say and it's I know it's not for me I think this might be it and consistently what I notice about the people who suddenly go oh yeah is these are people who either consciously and or unconsciously have started to to notice the tensions and contradictions around them Mm. so they hear the rhetoric of leadership or the rhetoric of change and they're kind of going but that doesn't square that doesn't make sense in its simplest terms some sometimes they're going but that's totally absurd and though that's what I, I think is 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 the those are the people who who if not quickly transition the transition is really clear because od helps them make sense of the contradictions the people who struggle to then i suppose sustain their relationship with od are the ones who still hold or have a model of change um which doesn't embrace contradictions doesn't embrace paradox doesn't in, in, embrace shadow those people will really struggle to stay in OD, or they may have the label, but I would question whether or not they're doing OD. Mm. And, and on the program itself, like, what would you do to help them sort of come to that sort of realization? What kind of exercises yeah. do you do them to? Well, I suppose there's 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 a there's a dance here between theory and practice. So on the one hand, you can mm. say, um, so I've, I've got a, I'm doing a one day introduction for OD for a client um, in in, that, in the social care sector soon. Um, and I'm, I'm having to, at the moment, design something that one hand attends to the fact that these people don't know much about OD. So here we go. Here's the morning, which is some theory and some stuff about OD. And this is what it is. And this is where it comes from. And there you go. There's the, the, the talk bit. And I have to collude with that up to a point. But the other bit, there has to be some stuff that really asks them who they are. Mm. What do they stand for? Um, one of the things I consistently do when I work with practitioners, I invariably get to a point where I will say to them, so what's your solid ground? And if somebody says, well, what do you mean? It's okay. When, when something happens in a client relationship where you are being rocked and you are being, something's going where you're absolutely feeling yourself being shoved off your feet. What is it that grounds you and anchors you and means that you can either you know, move with it and come back? And some people have a really good sense of that. They kind of go, it's okay, it's my values, or it's where I come from, it's my family, it's my faith. You know, it could be a number of things. Mm. But it's really interesting when somebody doesn't have, an, have a clear answer in their own minds to that, because then you get into a conversation about why are they already off, off balance? Mm. Why do they already find it difficult to hold their ground? And that's when you're getting into the whole self as instrument stuff. Who are you? What do you stand for? What's your backstory? Why do you want to do this work? How are you when you come up against a, a, a white, pale, stale, middle-aged man who wears a suit and has got director in his job title and is gunning for you? What are you going to do? Yeah, because I guess obviously, you know, with o, the DOD work or whether, you're, you know, you're leading that sort of change initiative, you know, as you sort of said, you're trying to change a human system. Um, and you talked about the rocking. We'll come. We'll come into that in a second. Like, what does that and why does it happen, and, and what can you do to sort of insulate yourself against it? Um, but I guess because you are changing it, one of the sort of talks that you're saying, you sort of, you, you often face with the question: How do I pro- progress in my career and move up, um, or how do I be of most service to the system? And yeah. I guess for me, that was kind of at the nub of it. It's like, what what is your intention? What what are you trying to do? And it's like, what's the highest context for you? Well, okay, well, and that's, if we kind of like cut to the chase, right, that's, that's where you get to a, to a fundamental question about your relationship with OD and its values. If you are an internal practitioner and you are faced with a choice, which, where you know in the, the, if you go this way, 
you are doing what what you believe is needed to help your client but if you go but if you go that way you are jeopardizing your career within that within that organization or if you go this way you are ensuring that you don't jeopardize your career and that you actually are preserving your status your position and your potential for for going up that is a fundamental ethical question mm. um and if you go this way there's no right or wrong to this to be really clear i, I was to be really clear about it. i'm not judging saying this is wrong i'm just asking us to be honest with ourselves yeah um if you're saying i need to make sure that i still can pay the mortgage at the end of the month so i'm not going to go there that might be might be in opposition to od values and in opposition to what the system needs yeah so, really clear about that. so it's, it's about make taking responsibility for your choices and yeah and let's not pretend you know i would suspect all of us at points have gone do you know what I, I think that's what's needed but right now i'm not resourced to do it yeah and, and to get super practical these might be like initiatives that maybe they don't agree with or decisions that you know the, the, the senior leader saying this is the right way but there's there's more information or there's marginalized voices that might have a different perspective and the path of well, least resistance is often to to agree with them in the short term isn't it well, there's, there's, there's something I'm, I'm, uh, about three years ago i did some diagnostic work for a, a series of only practice programs we were running in a big tech company um and one of the interviews i did with a, a senior leader he said at one point something really interesting this was about the participants who were going to go on this program he said we need them to operate at several grades above their pay level just think about that for a minute so you want these people who are two or three levels below director level to be skilled self-aware and confident enough and pay less than you, but to be able to work at your level. So let's just think about that for a minute. So mm. aside from the unfairness aspects of it, the fact you're getting arguably senior level skills for lower level pay, um, you're basically saying you want people to develop their practice such that they are totally comfortable swimming in the ecosystem of senior leadership with all the power and politics and status stuff that goes on there. That's the implications. Yeah, it's, it's almost an abdication of responsibility from the senior leaders then, because if they're there doing that, then what are they doing? Are they doing the heavy lifting for them, aren't they? Well, there's a tension. I've, I've talked to other practitioners quite regularly about this, you know, their experience of, of when when clients abdicate responsibility. You know, I want to give this to you because you're OD. And the number of times I hear OD practitioners and change consultants saying, no, I've pushed back and gone, no, 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 no. Let's be really clear. I'm here to help you do that. That's your responsibility. Don't make me responsible. For I am temporary scaffolding. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, but there, there's a shadow in OD there because I have also heard. Um, so if you if you if you hear OD people say, "Well, that organisation needs an OD function," really. So one of one of my beliefs is that we are too obsessed with centres of excellence. Um, you know, if we only had a, a program office or a change management function or transformation function, um, what that's doing is centralising the very skills and mindset work that actually need to be propagated in other parts of the organisation. So who are the people and where are they who need to have these skills developed? You don't need a function. So that. OD is complicit in that sometimes. We're complicit in, in, in wanting there to be an OD function or an OD department mm. or an OD role, saying, yes, let's build one over here. Well, what question are you trying to answer when you do that? Yeah, interesting. Um, and I, I, it, I think it's one of the things that gets missed is, so what's the upside to OD? Like, because what, what, <laughs> we're naturally drawn to deficit and the challenges of it. But but what, what does it mean to actually, you know, deliver outcomes or you know for it to go in a way that you what are the, what is the upside for either the consultant the system well if we're doing if we're doing, we're doing our work okay i I'd, I'd, I'd take the od off for a moment what's the upside of having somebody who's helping you um change your own organization the upside i would hope is that you leave with the client more able to be uh, more able to to um facilitate and lead their own change that they can mm -hmm. do this work themselves you've built capability that 
people have got more awareness of how to scaffold the conversations they need to have rather than having to bring somebody in to, to, to help them do it. Um, and that you've, and I'm going to be really, specific, really careful here, you've added value. So there's a German management consultant and practitioner called Niels Flieging, and one of the things I like about his work, he's one of the few people who talks really explicitly about value creation. Mm. And he would argue that unless there's value creation going on in the organisation, and actually you're thinking about change from the point of view of value creation, then what on earth are you doing? So how are you helping value creation within the organisation? And you can define that in many ways. You know, it's not mm. just monetary, it's also um, in terms of productivity, it's in terms of you know, happiness, multiple ways of, of defining it. But I, that's kind of where I go. It's building capability that the organisation, the stories that people are telling about what their lived experience is there are different to, to, to when you arrive in a positive way. Um, and that there is value being created in a way that is um, beneficial to people both within the organisation but ultimately who they are there to serve. So if you if you're sort of making that transition into OD, you know, you make them, you know, from solving problems and, you know, the, the inevitable dopamine hit that comes from it. I guess what you're sort of talking about is almost like sort of understanding what you've built and taking a step back from it. And, and it's just running exceptionally well without your involvement. I, I mean, it says on my website, and I really believe it. My, you know, part of my role is to make myself redundant. I'm really upfront about it. I had a client, I'm working with a client at the moment and they said to me, um, you know, we think that this gig is going to be, could be a year, could be two years. I said, no, no, let's just, okay, let's say it'll be a few months. And if it, it goes longer, then fine, let's talk about it. But no, let's not collude with the idea you need me for a year or two. That's just signaling right from the off that you want to be dependent on me. And then, mm. and you talked about the stroking earlier on. You know, that's the ethical thing. I could have gone, yeah, okay, I think you're right. And I know culture work, it's culture work. I know culture work is a long, it's a long project. You know, it is years mm. but it, i don't think it serves our clients to go and yes it will definitely mean you need me for two years i might be the wrong person in in a year's time it might be at that point we decide do you know what you actually now need somebody else because mm. of the way things are changing brilliant and uh, obviously one of the things that sort of drew me initially was and the idea behind the, the session that we're, we're running and it will be running for us is all about being at the center of change and you sort of talked about the metaphor being being pushed back when the system starts to, you know, because you are disrupting a system and, you know, you're disturbing patterns. And as, as people start to, well, how do people feel resourced to actually be able to deal with that? And, and what are some of the examples of, of what people see when they start to disrupt systems? Um, that's a really interesting question. It's so subjective, though. This is a subjective conversation anyway, so it's like... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, th I, guess, I guess that's particularly subjective because... You know what? What may phase me may be water off a duck's back for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's in that sense. Um, okay. Just, just so, just frame that question for me again. So I, I guess well, there's, there's sort of two parts to it. So for the second part was just like, what are examples of what systems do? You know, when they push back, what do they look like? Um, and you sort of talked about the senior leader with all the experience saying no. Um, and and we've all all consultants have got examples or, or um, business partners that have been driving change. Um, have got examples of that. And and the second thing is like, how do you feel that resourced to actually deal with whatever the system does? I mean, there's many examples of, of the kind of the pushback. Um, so, so I'll give two examples because I think that they talk to two two quite different kinds of hmm. patterns that emerge. So one is a, a healthcare organisation I was in a few years ago. And a year and a half before I'd started working with this leadership um, group, it was, a, it was, it was a, a day about change leadership as part of a wider leadership program. And the story I was told was that the, there had been one very senior member of clinical staff, very senior, who was incredibly toxic in their behaviour, bullying, in a really unhappy, unhealthy place, and had people around them who also amplified that behaviour. New CEO came in on day one, got rid of this person. Now, nobody knew whether or not they'd intended to do that before they came in or whether they just met this person and went, right, you're out. In a sense, it doesn't matter, but came in and kind of went, no, you're out. But this is the interesting thing. Bear in mind, this was a year and a half after. And, and we had on this day somebody as a guest speaker who was the COO of this organisation, lovely guy, who talked very coherently about his experience of being in that, mm. that, that culture. But as he was being questioned by participants, it became crystal clear that one or two people in the group 
their behaviours were still configured by the fear and anxiety that they felt a year and a half ago that was still latent in the system. So, you know, people had left, or the key player had left a year and a half ago, but the behaviours were still being heavily influenced by the, the memory of those experiences. The story had not yet fully changed. And I, you know, I don't, I've not been in since, so I don't know what's happened. But that's an example for me of how long it takes for things to change, even when people have left. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I, I was not going into work in the consulting role with that organisation, but had I been in there, wow, you're then into a, a place of, well, what, what are the stories people are telling and what might need to change in order for people to change their stories? Um, so that's one. The other one, um, what happens when it happens at a one-to-one -one level is a really interesting one. So I talked earlier on about how you can be challenged. A few, uh, another experience I had was working with an HR team that were together planning what effectively was the closure of the UK arm of a, of a global business. And I challenged them on something on day two that they were skipping over some aspects of at a cultural level, at an emotional level, I think it was, of, of what was going on. I can't remember the detail. That's not important. What is important is this. There was one of the senior leaders in the room who, it wasn't that he disagreed with me, but he was deeply offended and furious that I'd had the temerity and that I'd gone there. And that second day, um, you know, my primary client in the room, the, this most senior person, backed me in effect and said, no, I think Steve's, he's onto something. But if I'd have met this person in a dark alley outside a pub on a Friday night with, with the look in his eye that he gave me, particularly when he came to shake my hand at the end of the day, I would have thought he was going to lamp me. He was that incandescent. It was, it, I, I used the word very advisedly, it was almost hatred. Mm. Um, and it was, a, it, you know, when I took it to supervision, what, when, what, what somebody said to me was it was almost like a pure case of projection a projective identification. I had had something projected onto me that was, was actually nothing to do with me, but it was all to do with him. Which is really interesting because this kind of stuff doesn't come up on a project plan, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no which, which goes to when I talked about solid ground mm. and the life's work. You know, what is it? You know, that's, that's, those are the moments where, you know, when you say you want to do OD or do change practice, um, you know, you can do a 10 day program, but you've got to do your work mm. to get comfortable with that or to be able to get through it and or get through it, even if you're coming out the other side and part of you still a wibbling wreck. Yeah, because it, it can be quite unexpected and come from very mundane things, can't it? You can just be bringing people together for whatever. And it just something happens, doesn't it? And then it's like, so you have to be kind of ready for when it happens and the ability to because you know, the temptation in that moment would be. You know, either to respond in a defensive way or a counter-aggressive way and whatnot, to take it intensely personally and, you know, oh, you know, it's my fault. There's a really interesting thing in there, I think, which is, is this is where it gets really human, Gary, which is when you're faced with a strong emotion, because we can all be into intellectual about it, and let's, let's do some OD stuff and come up with a Bert Litwin model. And, oh, 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 yeah, brilliant, it's all good stuff. But you're faced with somebody who's looking you in the eye and there's, there's a real rush of emotion. And I, I had another guy on a, a different program who I really liked, but he got really exercised and angry about what we were talking about. And, at what, and he was quite close to me physically. And at, at, at a certain point I went to, basically I said, look, back off. It's effectively mm. what I said to him, just, you know, back off. And credit to him, he kind of went, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, he kind of mm. got what he was doing. But I felt in me a visceral response, which was, now back, excuse the language, back fuck off. Mm. Um, and the intellect bit is really important, our ability to kind of do all this. But when we talk about self as instrument, this is the whole person bit. It's, it's head, heart, gut. It's not just heart, it's gut. So when something happening at a visceral level in somebody else and in you, how it goes to your second part of the question you know how resourced are you to hold whatever it is is going on in you and to hold that in relationship to and with mm. this other visceral thing that's going on in the other person yeah and i, and I think um so when you are doing a conversation like this because there, there's a certain thing that says you know 
let's make this aesthetically a nice session. You know, let's, you know, and, and I think sometimes when people, so, um, so if people are preparing to do change and they do the slides and whatnot, and they, you know, they want, want it to go really smoothly, but it's often that change isn't aesthetically pretty. Well, and then you can have sessions where things just happen and it's like, okay, well, that's just happened. Okay. The, the, yeah, everything that was in place needs to be put to the side and we need to yeah. we need to work on this now and this is you know they're not going to thank us at the end of the session but this will make more profound change later on as well so there's a really interesting guy called keith jones i don't know if you come across him so no. keith and his partner tessa, tessa have written a really great book called provoke which is about facilitation and when i've talked to keith about facilitation you know i've learned i learned I kind of confirmed something for me in my own head and it did influence how I work. So Keith talks about compressive interventions. Okay. So, you know, in, 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 in group facilitation, but also in terms of, I could argue, one-to-one -one work, but also consulting, you know, if you think about it, if there's going to be a shift, sometimes you have to create the conditions for compression so that, you know, the client or clients, they can't stay as they are. Something has to give in relation to that. Mm. Now, compressive intervention could be a question. It could be you know, a series of statements. It could be a number of things. But in that conversation, Keith said something really interesting. He basically said to me, the limit sometimes is the, is the degree to which a facilitator is prepared to take a risk, not the client's willingness to go there. Mm -hmm. So I used an example of working with you know, Action Learning Set where I made an intervention as somebody who was talking about their, 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 their kind of lifeline. I said, so on a scale of one to ten, how hard on, us, on, on yourself are you? And this person said, probably a ten. Um, to which my response was, yeah, I kind of thought so. And what Keith said to me when I was sharing the story with him was, an alternative would have been to say, okay, so why don't you turn it up to twelve then? See what happens. And what he was saying was, you know, what I'd done was, you know, we'd named it, but what yeah. we hadn't done is created the conditions where maybe it mm. would have been interesting to help the client kind of go, oh, okay, well, what is the other side of that line to really apply some compression? And there is an ethical question here, which is, you know, how resourced and how skilled do you think you are to do that? And, and are you really sure that's the appropriate thing? But the essential point here is, do we sometimes hold back because actually we do, we're not brave enough? Yeah. Well, it, it, there's a couple of things there, aren't there? Which is that it's obviously there's the term psychological safety, but it's better to sort of say, is it safe enough to try that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally, totally with you. Yeah. yeah. So I, in my work, I talk about creating useful discomfort in service of learning. Yeah. And and, and the other thing um, that I sort of talk about and you talk about as well um, is, is like informed consent. Well, the contracting piece is, is yeah. key. I mean, you, you asked earlier on, what's the difference between somebody who's got OD and not? I would argue that if, unless they can contract well, then they haven't got it and recontract well. Yeah. Um, and also understand the difference between contracting around task and relationship. Yeah. It sounds so obvious, but the number of times I've worked with um, change practitioners of any, any description and they come out off the end of, of a program and they go, do you know what I'm taking away? It's that contracting thing. Yeah. Consistently. <laughs> Yeah, because it sets the context, doesn't it? And I, the, the challenge that you sometimes have about contract, again, I'm always talking about this, is uh, Peter Fuda in Australia sort of talks about when you are sort of trying to contract and it, the people generally don't know what they want until they see it a lot of the time. So it's like you're trying to contract for something that may never happen. Or they, or they just yeah. don't know what they're, what they're agreeing to. And he sort of describes it's like expectations, like a third, a third, a third. So a third of expectations are, are conscious and articulated. I can I can tell you what I want and what I'm happy with. A third are like they're they're conscious, but I'm not going to articulate them to you because you know either you should know that or you know I don't want to tell you that you know. Um, and a third are unconscious and unarticulated. So it's like um, I I generally don't know what I want until I see it. Until I'm sitting in the room and my team are being very emotional, someone's having a reaction, then this but, is not what I'm... but then you're into that you're back into that thing around the projections onto onto us as consultants or practitioners and what role are we explicitly contracting to play mm. are we you know if you if you look at the consulting industry most of the big firms sell on the basis of expert pair of hands they don't sell on the basis of collaborative partner not explicitly um it tends to be independents or small consultancy firms that tend to say that they're going to work in a more collaborative space. So, so that would be 
sort of along just talk us through what that would be in practice then so if, if we're going to sort of take that approach to working with a client and we're contracting with them what, what would that look like well it's the difference between saying you know um it's, it's the, the kind of classic peter block thing of and, and others have talked about the different consulting moments expert you know I co- you, i'll come in i'll tell you what the problem is um, and i'll tell you what the solution is and recommend what you do pair of hands is you know you you i think you know what the problem is um, and I'll just give you as many bodies or as much resources as you need to do it, which is where the big firms make a lot of money because they're just selling loads of graduate trainees, um, and they can they can do that well. And then the third one is you know the collaborative or per, um, collaborative kind of process consultant where you're you you and I together will work out what the problem is, and you and I together will work out how we might address it. Mm. Um, but of course, that third one doesn't do the, what the first two do which is um, effectively say to the client, um, we'll help you manage your anxiety and, and reduce it and minimise it. The first one is, you know, absolutely, give, give your problem to me. It's not your problem anymore. And I've, the number of times in the last few years I've heard of people saying they've had a report from a big, typically a big consultant firm who've come in and done the expert thing, written a report, and then they've left and it's been put in a drawer and not acted on. So it's about yeah about it, it does it really create the change that they're that they're seeking as well. Honestly, Brilliant. I would argue no. I would argue no. So so interestingly that there's a real dependency thing here. There's a very very large brand who I cannot name who I worked with quite a bit a few years ago, and a couple of their people I was having a conversation with, and we counted the number of consultancy firms they had traipsing through there at that time, and we lost count when we hit double figures. Right. <laughs> okay. And as I got to work with them, I got to know and. I now have a friend who 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 um, I, was my client there, and they said to me that you know when the they they had all the big players in McKinsey's PwC I mean you know all of them and mid and 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 one of these big players had the courage and the honesty to say we're not going to do this anymore you just need to make a decision this you know we've, you've had everybody in just just decide but that was the exception that was not the norm. Brilliant. Well, we're just coming up for the hour now. So I just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed it. Like I've, I've got a load of references and I just want to sort of thank you for uh, just being, being a real honesty and, and freshness to the whole area. Um, I'm really looking forward to the session on the, 8th, the 18th of October. Um, if you do want to get tickets, then just obviously just contact me on LinkedIn and we can arrange that for you. Um, if people want to get hold of you, Steve, what's the best way to contact you? Uh, find me on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Steve Hearson there. Um, I don't think there, there's another one who's an academic, but he's not very visible. Um, does some stuff, stuff on buildings or something. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the only really one. Uh, and it's very simple. My email address is steve at hearsome.com. So H E A R S U M dot com. Brilliant. I'm um, wishing you lots of luck for your um, your supervision program that launches in in November, and we really look to hear hear how that goes. And I look forward to really seeing you on the 18th. So thank you so much. You're welcome.